Acts, we're in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16. So if you open your Bibles up or your smartphones up, Kate, you did a great job. There's some big words in there. So thank you so much. Uh, she thought she was going to have to read six more verses. And I said, no, no, just the verse 10. We're good. For those visiting, we are going through the book of Acts, and we're not hitting every single verse nor even every single chapter, but it is an incredible book to read. And if you struggle, like a lot of us do, about where to start reading in the Bible, the book of Acts is actually a great place to start. It explains the birth of the church, and it's awesome seeing what Holy Spirit does through those very first Christians. And we only have a couple more weeks left for this sermon series with the book of Acts. But just a quick review. Last, last couple weeks, on April 16th, we looked at the church partners. And then on April 23rd, we looked at the church multiplies. And then April 30th, we looked at the church values the gospel, which was last week. The gospel first and always. That is why we live. That is why we exist. It's all about Jesus. It's not about us feeling good or just coming together to have an experience with God. It is to glorify him for who he is and what he does. Today, the church follows God is the title of today's sermon. The church follows God. And so we read it, Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 10. But I'm going to read another passage to you. Let's go ahead and stand up. It's Acts chapter 15. And this is just going to give a context of where we are. Acts chapter 15, it's the verses before it, starting in verse 36. And then we'll read verse 16, chapter 16, verse 5. I've got horrible allergies and I'm getting ready to sneeze. So I pray this microphone doesn't get blown out. But anyway, bear with me if I sneeze. But right here, Acts chapter 15, verse 36, it says this. After some time had passed, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers and sisters in every town where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take along John Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take along this man who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone on with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they, plant, they parted company and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed off to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed after being commended by the brothers and sisters to the grace of the Lord. He traveled through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul went on to Derbe and to Lystra, where there was a disciple named Timothy, the son of a believing Jewish woman, but his father was a Greek. The brothers and sisters at Lystra and Iconium spoke highly of him. Paul wanted Timothy to go with him. So he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, since they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled through the towns, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem for the people to observe. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and grew daily in numbers. Let us pray. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Father, we thank you, we praise you, we love you. <coughs> wow. We thank you for coughs. And for allergies, we're supposed to give thanks to you in everything. And I would love some water if someone could get me some water. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. Speak to us. Bring encouragement, strength, conviction, revelation. Oh, Father, you're awesome. We praise you for adopting us as your sons and daughters. And overwhelm us today with your word with your goodness, with your love, with your holiness. Transform us, Jesus, and we love you. We ask all these things in your precious name, Lord. Amen and amen. You all may be seated. <coughs> you getting some? All right, good, thanks. All right. Acts chapter 15, just a quick review here. Paul and Barnabas were the first official missionaries sent out in the church of Antioch. And after they had returned to Antioch, and Antioch was one of these growing it, multicultural, multi-socioeconomic churches, hundreds of miles north of Jerusalem. 
God was doing so much there that Jewish Christians from Jerusalem went up to Antioch and began teaching, saying, you must be circumcised and obey the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, in order to be saved. That's what we looked at last week. And it was such a fight and argument that Paul, Barnabas, and several went back down to Jerusalem to have a discussion. And it was the first Jerusalem council with all the apostles and the elders. And they decided, no, no, no. It is by grace alone, faith alone in Jesus that we are saved. And that's what the apostles and elders, that's the conclusion they came to through the power and presence of Holy Spirit. And the believers, Paul and Barnabas, Silas and others, went back to Antioch to share that. Because that discussion and argument back then, you had two people groups within the early church. Jewish Christians who still, who still held on to the Old Testament laws and regulations. And then Gentile believers. And the big discussion back then is how Jewish do Gentiles need to become to be saved? And for us, 2,000 years later, we're kind of like, eh, that really doesn't matter much to us. But in our day and age, there's numerous cultural issues that do go on throughout the church in our day and age. What's Christian? What isn't Christian? What's allowed? What's not allowed? And it's vital that we understand and know what is the essence of the gospel, the essence of faith. And so they delivered the decision from Jerusalem to Antioch, and the people rejoiced. It's by faith alone in Jesus. It's his grace that we're saved. It's not because we get baptized. It's not because we do a bunch of good works. It's not because we become this or that in Jesus. Thank you, Wayne. Oh, no, you don't want me blowing my nose, but I appreciate it anyway, just in case. Good. Thank you. And so that is what happened. And then as we read here in this long passage from 15, after a while, Paul told Barnabas, let's go back and visit all those churches from that visit, that missionary trip we took. And they were in unity, right? Mm. Barnabas wanted to take Mark, who had abandoned them in the first trip. Saul did, I mean, Paul didn't want to. And they had such desacuerdos, he say in English, Spanish. They disagreed so harshly that they ended up splitting. When you read 2 Timothy, you'll realize that Paul was wrong, and he realized it too, that he was wrong. But just like Barnabas always was, the son of encouragement, he knew how to walk alongside younger, immature believers and lift them up, and that's what he did with Mark. But Paul took Silas, and they started to travel again, retracing their steps to all the different churches that they were visiting. And that's what Kate read to us today in verse 6 through 10. And there's three things that we're going to look at today. Three very important points in Acts chapter 16, 6 through 10. Say three. It's easy. It comes after two. Three. Three. Here they are. The first one is this. Sometimes opposition comes from the Lord. Sometimes in our life, it feels like we're hitting against the goads as Jesus told Saul. It seems like we're getting pressed down on every side. And we think it might be the devil or maybe someone else or something or situations. And sometimes it's just the Lord pressing upon us because he's molding and shaping us into the image of Jesus. We're going to look at that here in this passage. The second point, as you can see, is God speaks to us. He is a living, alive being who's created us in his image. And he wants to have a relationship with each and every one of us. And he speaks to us. The third thing is immediate obedience. Those are the three points we're going to look at today. But before we dive into this passage, I have a story. I want a story I want to share with you, but I've got a question. Who here has ever been lost in the woods, in the mountains, on a hike, maybe in the car? Who's been lost? Okay, raise your hands high. Come on. How's it feel? Oh, once, once, just once? Okay. I get lost every day. Back when I was in college, a group of us went up to, I think it was northern Wisconsin in late January. And there were about a dozen of us, and there were two Tennesseans, me and one other guy. And we were at this camp, and sometime during that week we were there. It's called Honey Rock Camp. Braden, you know, you probably have heard about Honey Rock. And everybody decided to go cross-country skiing. And me and my buddy who are from Tennessee, I mean, we're the two southerners. I mean, we've cross-country skied all the time, right? 
So we go out. We've never been before. And we get on this trail. I have no idea where we're going. I have no idea how far it's going to be. And as we go cross-country skiing, it was obvious within 10, 15 minutes that me and my friend, we we're going to have a hard time. We kept following over. And the rest of our group, I mean, they were so encouraging and they were so just considering us more important than themselves that they left us in the dust, or better yet, the snow. And within 30 minutes, they were gone and out of sight. And after about an hour, I realized we might be in big trouble. Six hours later, it was getting dark. And all I knew what to do for those six hours is I need to follow that trail. I hope it's circular because I have no idea where I'm going. But Jesus, I'm going to trust you. And about halfway through, it started to snow a lot. And the skis of our friends who went before us, I could still kind of see them. But I'm like, Lord, mm, I hope this is getting us back to camp. It got dark. But because of the way snow is, you can kind of see in the nighttime with snow. And about 7 o'clock, seven hours later, we rolled into camp covered from head to toe with snow. And our group, they were like, Ooh, we had just called the rescue team. And, uh, but I scared to death. I couldn't feel my toes. I couldn't feel my fingers. I was so mad, about lost my salvation. But all I knew is I needed to keep going forward, not stop, and trust the Lord, his goodness, and his faithfulness. Right here in Acts chapter 16, verse 6, this is what it says. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, and they had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. That's weird, isn't it? When they came to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Wow. Okay, I got this amazing map, and this map, hopefully you can see it well, but this is the map of Paul's second missionary journey. They start over here on the far right-hand side. You might see Antioch, and then they travel up north through Cilicia. They go through what's called Galatia, and you kind of see the red line. You'll see if you can read those notes. That's where they picked up Timothy. It says they tried to go into Pamphylia, but the Holy Spirit wouldn't allow them to do that. Hmm. Aren't they on a mission trip? Aren't they supposed to plant churches and share the gospel? They want to kind of go south where you can see Pamphylia. They want to go in there, but it says the Holy Spirit wouldn't allow them. And so they head north up into Asia, and they try to go up into Bithynia. But it says the Spirit of Christ wouldn't allow them to speak there either. Wait a second. I thought, aren't they supposed to make disciples? Aren't they supposed to share Jesus? And yet two times it says the Holy Spirit wouldn't allow them to speak, wouldn't allow them, the Spirit of Christ, to go in. Now, if you're paying attention... The Spirit of Christ is just another name for Holy Spirit. This is part of the amazing mystery of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And one of the names of Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. When Jesus told his disciples that he would never leave us or abandon us, how and why? Because he's given us his Holy Spirit. The very Spirit and presence of Jesus lives inside of us. And so as Paul and Timothy and Silas and their whole ministry team, they're called and they're called to make disciples. And so they want to go to these places and plant churches. But right here it says twice that God wouldn't allow them to do that. And then as we continue reading here in verse 8, passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And during the night, Paul had a vision which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. So go back to that map, Chris, if you don't mind. From Antioch, way over on the far right-hand side, they travel through, through Cilicia, through Galatia, and they go up through Asia, they get to Mysia, and they get to Troas, which is on the coast. And if you look up in the far, your left-hand corner, Macedonia, that is Europe. The gospel started in Asia. And if you remember several weeks ago when Philip preached and proclaimed the gospel to the 
Ethiopian eunuch. So the gospel starts in Asia. It goes to Africa. And this chapter right here is the first time the gospel goes into Europe, Macedonia. This is a 400-mile trek that they took. And in God's incredible sovereignty and his great plan, he wouldn't let them stop in other places throughout Galatia and Asia to share the gospel. Because God knows the hearts of everyone. And he was preparing the heart of the Macedonians to receive the gospel. And so Paul had a vision, one dream, when they're in Troas, all the way across Asia, which is modern-day Turkey. Paul has this vision, and when he wakes up, he in this vision, he sees this Macedonian man. It says, pleading for him to come over and help them. And here in verse 10, it says in verse 10, after he had seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So what are those three points? Those three points are that sometimes God... Opposition comes from the Lord. God speaks to us and then immediate obedience. We're going to look at these three points very quickly. Sometimes opposition comes from the Lord. We live in God's wonderful, incredible creation. And before the fall, after he created Adam and Eve, he said it was very good. This creation is amazing. But once Adam and Eve sinned and sinned and sin entered into the world, Scripture is very clear that all of creation groans because it's incarcerated by sin and death. We have an enemy, the devil, and all his demons who hate us, and they do attack us. We live in a world that hates Jesus and hates his followers. So we have opposition from demons and the devil. They're not omnipotent, and they neither are omnipresent nor omniscient, but they are powerful, and they do attack us. We live in a world that hates us, and then our own sin nature, the old man that we have, we still fall into sin and temptation. And so we have these three battlefronts that come after us every day. But on top of that, there are times when the Lord will press down upon us, and it's his hand disciplining us. And I believe right here in this chapter here as Paul and Silas and them traveled up through trying to plant churches all throughout Asia and the Holy Spirit, nope, here you can't, nope. And I can imagine for Paul and Silas and Timothy and their team, they're asking, what in the world is going on? You've called us to make disciples and to make plant churches and yet you won't let us? And so they keep traveling and keep traveling in the Holy Spirit. Nope, not here. Nope, you can't go here. And it doesn't say how the Holy Spirit nor the Spirit of Christ kept them from doing it. But as they traveled 400 miles, which would take weeks, it makes me wonder if they began to question, Lord, what are you doing? Why? A verse that the Lord has used in my life over the past couple years, it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. It's a very hard verse to embrace. But this is God speaking through Moses to God's people as they're in the desert. They're getting ready to cross into the promised land after 40 years in the desert. And look at what God says. Remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness so that you might, so that he might what? Humble you. Who likes to be humbled here? Anybody like to be humbled? Oh, it hurts. If you want to be courageous, pray that the Lord humble you. Ask him, Jesus, humble me. God left them in the desert. He didn't leave them. He led them through the desert for 40 years to humble them and test you to know what is in your heart whether or not you would keep his commands. Now, I've got a question. God, who is omniscient, which means he knows everything, is there anything he needs to learn and know? Yet it says that God humbled them and tested them so that what? To know what was in your heart? God already knew what was in their heart. 
It was so Israel could know what was in their hearts. God will press us and squeeze us. And sometimes it looks like he's actually opposing us. Because he's molding us into his image. And sometimes that opposition that we sense is actually the Lord Jesus. When you squeeze toothpaste, what comes out? If you're saying toothpaste, you're wrong. It's whatever's, if you squeeze a bottle of toothpaste, sorry, what comes out? It's whatever's in it. When we get squeezed and hard pressed, it will reveal our hearts. How do we respond? when we face opposition. With humility, with love, with obedience, with faith, with charity, with goodness, with forgiveness, with steadfastness, clinging on to the Holy Spirit, allowing him to lead and guide us. Number two, God speaks to us. The second point in this passage is God speaks to us. Right here we see that God spoke to Paul through a vision. And God does speak to us through dreams and visions. You read all throughout the Old and New Testament, there are numerous times when God speaks through dreams. In fact, when Peter proclaimed the gospel on the day of Pentecost, he quoted Joel chapter 2, where it says, your sons and daughters will dream dreams and have visions. Now, for a lot of us evangelicals, we get really nervous. Ooh, dreams and visions, ooh, that's real subjective. Yeah, it can be extremely subjective. First and foremost, God speaks to us through his written word. We read the written word to encounter the living word. And there's absolutely nothing that God will say through a dream, through a vision, through a sermon, or through a podcast, or even through Christian songs that will ever contradict his written word. So if you hear something, you think God is speaking to you, and it contradicts what he's already told us here, it's not of the Lord. But many of us will deceive ourselves because we so desire something in our lives and we'll pray and we'll pray and we'll pray and we try to fit it into the box that we want to have for our lives when God is actually telling us no. And so God does speak to us through dreams, through visions, through other believers, through sermons and through Christian songs and through podcasts. He does so. My favorite movie is The Return of the King, which is the third installment of the Lord of the Rings series. And I cry almost every time when I watch the end when the king comes with all of his cavalry and it just reminds me of Jesus. I haven't seen a good movie since that movie came out 20 years ago. And God speaks to me powerfully through that movie. But it's not his written word. God speaks to us and it's vital and I know you guys know this, but it's vital for us to read scripture The book of Acts, the journals that we've passed out for these past couple months, I love it. And I know all of us know that we need to read God's word. We need to do it every day, the shoulda, coulda, wouldas. But as believers, I want to encourage you, and we've got a sign over there, that picture frame over there. It says 365-1511. If you read the Bible for 15 minutes a day, every day of the year, 365 days a year, you'll read the whole Bible in one year. 365.15, 365.15, 1, 1, and then why. If you're to read one chapter a day and then write down one verse that speaks to you, one, and then write down one paragraph of why and how that verse speaks to you, you will cultivate an incredible deep relationship with our Heavenly Father through the presence of Holy Spirit. I don't want to put another burden on top of you, but our Heavenly Father longs to have an intimate relationship with each and every one of us. And as we read his word, and if you do it 365 days out of the year for just 15 minutes, and you write down one verse, and then you write down one paragraph, how does this verse speak to me? A year from now, your relationship with Jesus will be so deep, so much more deep and profound than it is today. And Paul and Timothy and Silas, as they were traveling through Asia, wondering, okay, Holy Spirit, when are you going to say yes? God spoke to Paul through a vision, and they crossed over into Macedonia, and the gospel was planted in Europe, and God longs to speak to you, and it's vital that you consume his word, read that written word to encounter his living word. The last one is this, immediate obedience. 
It says right here in verse 10, after he had seen the vision, we immediately, say immediately, immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. We're commanded to obey. We obey God because we love God, and we love God because he first loved us. My question for you is, what is your next step of obedience? How is God speaking to you today? And you need to step out and say yes. How we use our time, how we use our finances, relationships, forgiving someone, asking for forgiveness, humbling yourself under your supervisor instead of complaining about how awful they are, lifting them up and praying for them and supporting their vision, forgiving your parents, forgiving your children, loving and being kind to your next door neighbor. I want to invite the worship team to come up. But my questions, I've got three questions today based and surrounded on these three points. Sometimes it is God who's opposing us. He wants to speak to us and he calls us to obedience. So here's my first question. I want to invite everybody to please stand with me, please. My first question is this. And just as we sing this song, as we pray, I want you to ask yourself this question too. Where is God working in your life? And how is he asking you to join him? The second question is, how is the Lord speaking to you today? And then what is your next step of obedience? I don't ask these questions to put on guilt or shame. With God, there's incredible grace, incredible mercy. We fail him all the time. And he still will always forgive, always invite us to join him. So as we worship, as we pray, there'll be a couple of us over here by next steps. We'd love to pray with you for you. Feel free to come over and pray with us. If you're right in the middle of a pew and you need five people to get out of the way, tell them, excuse me, please. We'd love to pray with you. Let us continue to worship. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing day. Lord, you are awesome and you're good and you're holy and you're perfect. There is no one like you, Jesus. Lord, as we worship you, glorify yourself. Help us to not only hear your voice and recognize it, but to obey you. You're always working in our lives. You're always working in our midst. Help us to follow you with great faith, with trust. And we ask these things in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.